Hi, this is Peter, and uh, I'm going to talk today a little bit about the ideas of Dadaism in art, focusing primarily on the work of one of the more, probably, I might even argue, one of the most influential artists of the 20th century, and that's uh, Marcel Duchamp. Marcel Duchamp is typically, I think, in the writing of art history in the early to mid 20th century, definitely had a role as a provocateur, um, somebody who challenged in a very significant way, uh, not just the conventions of, say, traditional academic figural uh, painting, you know, painting people or narratives or landscapes or whatever, but really kind of throwing over the table uh, the game of art in general. I think it's a good way of beginning to think about that. Duchamp is a very uh, interesting case. Uh, much like Picasso, he's actually quite good at um, quite good at uh, um, painting in a con relatively conventional fashion. So he has that ability to, uh, from a relatively early age, to imitate the art movements uh, uh, of his own time. Uh, so, for, for instance, Impressionism or working with things in a sort of Cezanne-esque mode. But the real genius that he had was basically... Um, looking at the conventions of the art world and even, and this is I think particularly important, even the conventions of the avant-garde. Um, we've looked at some of those already, uh, just starting with uh, the work of Edouard Manet or looking at the Impressionists or even through post-Impressionists, Fovis and uh, Cubists and so forth. Um, all of them seem to, in the end, rely on a kind of understanding of art as having purpose and meaning to explore um, the nature of vision or the nature of painting, the formal properties of paint. Um, that the avant-garde, in essence, was about trying to figure out something important about art um, and then express it, preferably in, in many of these instances on, that I've mentioned on a, on a canvas. So there's that conventional aspect of taking a blank canvas and then altering it formally to create a kind of coherent, uh, expressive uh, object that could be shown in a museum or, um, you know, sold in a gallery or, you know, even talked about in an art history class. And, you know, like I said, with the likes of Van Gogh, very, very serious um, in terms of his um, expressing his emotional state or Paul Cezanne saying, you know, he wants to do nature after Poussin, you know, heralding a 17th century French artist. There's a lot of seriousness going on in, in these enterprises for the most part. Um, Marcel Duchamp basically, uh, and I think with a considerable degree of humor and enthusiasm, points out to his contemporaries, and I, I think, again, the lesson is not lost on our contemporary art scene, that you could pretty much dispense with all of this. Um, you could decide not to take any of that particularly seriously anymore. Um, and there are lots of potential reasons for thinking about uh, art in this fashion. Um, Dadaism is often seen as a kind of response to the um, the horror, genuine horror, uh, the Great War, the effects of that are really very much still with us uh, to, the, to this day. The idea, in a nutshell, that European civilization, with all of its cultural achievements and philosophy and science and technology and, you know, so many uh, sort of benchmarks, in, let's just focus on art right now, uh, the likes of you know, Michelangelo, Leonardo, Raphael, to sort of put it on the 16th century end of the spectrum, all the way through, uh, you know, to the to the early 20th century, and maybe we'll just focus on science, for instance, the likes of Albert Einstein and and the, all the rest. Um, you know, that that's that's great, um, but the the 1914 inauguration of the Great War led very quickly to an extraordinary um, series of disastrous battles, carnage on a global scale, um, devastating 
uh, the nations of France, England, uh, Germany, elsewhere. Um, why, if this European culture is so rational and so um, elevated, how on earth could this happen? And so one of the one of the angles of Dadaist art is to say, well, you know, we're really just not interested in a cultural uh, from a cultural standpoint. Not interested in reason or rationality. That's basically turned into a very tragic farce at this point. Let's make art that goes against that. Um, that goes against that. It's you could argue, in a sense, that it echoes some of the critiques of civilization and culture going back to the a time of uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau in the 18th century critiques of the Enlightenment. And I think I think that's kind of what's happening with. Duchamp, but in a much more uh, playful, uh, critical, but also light-hearted way. It's a, kind of an interesting, he's a very fascinating uh, character. It's a great video of him explaining some aspects of his art, um, and I highly recommend you check it out. Uh, it's a nice black and white film, and, and he comes off as a, you know, not a particularly dour or dark or rebellious person. He's really just playing a game, and he sees art as a game, and I think that's important. The The way in which he um, plays this game is, is nicely seen in his series of ready-mades. Um, ready-made as an art category is interesting in its own right, because what we have is the idea not of an artist, say again, taking a a piece of marble or a blank canvas or whatever, and transforming it through the efforts of the artist, um, you know, making the blank canvas colorful or shaping the marble or casting the bronze and all that kind of stuff, um, but instead finding an object in the world. And really, by dint of calling it art, um, turning it into art. And if you think about it, again, as a critique of art conventions, that kind of could be what happens if you take the block of marble. How much do you have to work that block of marble before it becomes a work of art? Um, the Pietà by Michelangelo will say, okay, that is a, a work of art. But we know, for instance, and have numerous examples of unfinished works by Michelangelo. So is that a work of art? If Michelangelo, just to take the example of David, took that block of marble and put it up in his backyard and said, hey, that's a work of art, would we say, no, Michelangelo, you're wrong? It's a good question. In, this, in the 16th century, that wouldn't have been, quote-unquote, allowed. But when you start thinking about it, who's in charge of allowing this? Right? Who's, the, who's the committee? Who's the, the legislatures and legislators of uh, you know, what constitutes a work of art? So when you look at uh, um, the fountain... And the caption uh, that you'll typically read this is, is, is pretty funny. The original version, it's really neither here nor there if there is an original, because what it is is a urinal, right? a common utilitarian device um, that is not particularly glamorous, very functional. And all that you have to do to transform it into a work of art is sign it, in this case with a a punning and bogus signature, date it, tip it on its side, and you know, put it on a pedestal, and hey presto, you have a sculpture, which is kind of interesting. And indeed, this is something that forces, I think, a lot of artists going through the 20th century to really consider how important it is to work with stuff, whether it's paint, whether it's, you know, uh, stuff, uh, materials uh, used in sculpture, etc., is the artist's idea about what constitutes a work of art really much more important than the actual manipulation of material. So, you know, the, the standard sort of reactions of this, uh, he submits it to an, um, you know, a, a sort of jury committee in 1917. They say it's not going to be, this is not acceptable, and he writes back, whether Mr. Mutt with his own hands made the fountain or not has no importance. It's worth pointing out that lots of sculpture, especially in the 19th century, was designed by an artist but executed by actual sort of, sorts of experts in material. This is particularly the case with casting, but also with marble. So you put together a kind of model and then have it enlarged by experts. 
um, has no importance. He chose it, okay, which is a fair point. Again, coming back to Michelangelo, the artist's hand is guided by an idea, okay? So he chose it. He took an ordinary article of life, placed it so that it's useful significance. So, it's, you know, this isn't going to work well as a urinal anymore. It's going to really has been transformed from a utilitarian object to an aesthetic object. Uh, that useful significance disappears under the new title and point of view and created a new thought for that object. So that's Duchamp responding to the committee and, you know, he's definitely setting up the situation saying, hey guys, you know, this is, this is actually more difficult than you think. Okay, so the, so the fountain um, it works in reverse in a lot of ways. I think it's a, a very, very interesting thing from a, a, a sort of conceptual point to consider. Like, what are we talking about when we talk about art? This, the same playful uh, aspect is uh, seen in his modification, very minimal, of a picture postcard of the Mona Lisa, the most, perhaps, most famous painting in the Western tradition, where he uh, adds a mustache and goatee to her, not a particularly clever one, but certainly it'll do in, a, you know, typical kind of making fun of works of art. You might see, you know, kids do that, add these facial features. So that's, that's good. Remember the Dada has that childlike humor and then uh, gives the title at the bottom in, to English speakers. It will be L-H-O-O-Q, but to French speakers, it will sound a lot more like Ella Chocou which is a kind of pun basically saying in somewhat vulgar translation, uh, she has a hot ass. Um, that would be what it sounds like to a French speaker. So again, undermining the concept of, you know, fine art and high art and, and so forth with making fun of the Mona Lisa and also something um, oddly, what's the right word of this, sort of meaningless in terms of how we respond to it. He's like set up a challenge, even with a simple transformation of this, uh, uh, you know, extraordinary portrait. So there's definitely an engagement, I think, with the artists of the past and uh, present in, in Duchamp's work. Um, in this piece, uh, which is really quite interesting for, for 1915, uh, what's known as, uh, really just called for short, the large glass. Um, Duchamp has a much longer title, The Bride Stripped Bare by Her Bachelors comma even. Um, this is a really striking work of art for its time because it really heralds um, the conventions especially of sort of mid-century modernism, the use of glass and metal and a kind of radically abstracted vision combined with, and this is an interesting thing, despite the symbolism and motifs that um, Duchamp talks about and that's certainly valid. We don't really have time to go into them. But the precision and exactitude, the kind of machined aspect of this is definitely, I think, a harbinger of many art movements to come. Perhaps among the most interesting uh, of the many aspects of this is the fact that the, um, the glass, this is quite, quite tall, it's uh, nine feet tall, so it's a big, big object, in transport wound up breaking. And Duchamp, instead of saying, you know, this, this thing's been trashed, you know, oh, woe is me, simply incorporates that fracturing, and it's a brilliant metaphor, of course, for what's happening in the art world at this point. The fracturing becomes part of the work of art. He basically compresses that fracture glass between more sheets of glass. Um, and there's a fascinating, there are lots and lots of things we could say about this, but the sense of a combination of transparency and uh, opacity, um, solidity, <clears throat> and uh, this fragmented aspect, completeness and fragmentation. <clears throat> there are a lot of things that are happening in this piece. All of it in a curious combination of intentionality and random chance presented to the viewer with the idea of not saying, hey, this is a thing that has specific meaning, but this in a very real sense is a blank canvas that you're going to complete, not me. Um, you know, kind of how do you like that? So Duchamp is a very provocative, very interesting, complex artist whose achievements have really uh, provoked serious thought in the art world ever since. Well worth studying closely.